This is going to be 2 Corinthians chapter 5, part 2, and we're going to look at things the Lord took away. 2 Corinthians 5, 11, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf that ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. So knowing that therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We persuade men to get saved by believing the gospel. Then after they're saved, we persuade them to live right by telling them about the judgment seat of Christ because even though we're not judged for our sins at the judgment seat of Christ, it's still going to be a fearful thing. And... The Lord took away some things. He took away you having to go to hell. He took away you having to face him at the great white throne judgment in all of his wrath. He took away you having to go through the tribulation. He took a lot of things away. But the first thing we see he took away is any right to brag. It says in verse 12, for we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that you have that you may have somewhat to answer them, which glory in appearance and not in heart. Jesus Christ came and fulfilled all righteousness. He was faced with every temptation that we are faced with and came out spotless. And when compared to Jesus Christ, we have no right to brag. So Paul says in verse 12, For we commend not ourselves unto you. He's not going to brag on himself to the Corinthians. He knows it's the Lord that is good and it's not him. But at the same time, he gives them occasion to glory on his behalf. He wants them to do the commending of him because there are men out there who glory in appearance and not in heart. Like today, many people see a man with a huge church building and nice clothes and they think, well, this guy's super spiritual. But Paul didn't have these things. But he had other things that they could use to recommend him. In 2 Corinthians eleven twenty one through 28, it says, I, I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had not been, as though we had been weak. How be it? Whereinsoever any is bold, I speak foolishly. I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more, and labors more abundant, and stripes above measure, and prisons more frequent, and deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often in thirst, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. So that's Paul laying out all of his credentials there. But sometimes you have to give your credentials because people glory in appearance and not in heart. Sometimes people glory in if someone has a degree or a big building or a nice suit and, and things like that. But the Lord looks somewhere else. In 1 Samuel 16, 7, it says, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. But we have no right to brag because Jesus Christ fulfilled all righteousness. He is the one who lives a perfect life. Plus the things that impress sinful man does not impress an almighty righteous God. God's not impressed with anything that we do. The only way you can make him see you as good is to get saved. And then he impl uh, applies the Lord Jesus Christ record to you. But one of the things the Lord took away was any right to brag. And all these times where Paul seems to be bragging, he's not really bragging, he's laying out his credentials. Because he had all these people going around that were saying that he's not really apostle, they're saying that he's not really sent from God, 
They're saying he doesn't know what he's talking about. So Paul would lay out his credentials to show people that he does know what he's talking about. He's not bragging because the Lord took away any right to brag. And notice that when Paul did seem to be bragging, he said, I speak as a fool, showing you that it's foolish to brag about yourself because you're nothing. With all your accomplishments, they're nothing. In Philippians, Paul said he counts them but dung, meaning they're not worth anything. But that's the one thing the Lord took away was any right to brag. Jesus Christ fulfilled all righteousness when he came. He did it better than anybody's ever done it. And if you've not done it better than anybody ever has, then, you know, you really have no room to brag anyway. Another thing the uh, Lord took away is any excuse to live for self. When Jesus Christ came down in the flesh and served others and died for the sins of the whole world, with that in mind, we have no room to live for self. 2 Corinthians 5.13, it says, For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. If Paul is beside himself, meaning he looks crazy, then it's for Jesus Christ. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God. In Acts 26, 24, Festus said to Paul, Much learning doth make thee mad. In Mark 3, 21, they said Jesus was beside himself. 1 Peter 2, 9 says we are a peculiar people. To the world, you're crazy. Uh, 1 Peter 4, 4 says, Wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot speaking evil of you. I can't tell you how many times people have looked at me like I'm just flat out crazy. It's because I'm, we're different. If you're a Christian, you're just different. And uh, you, people see you as strange. And he says that we make a fool of ourselves for the Lord, basically. The Lord took away every excuse we had not to live for him. And he took away every excuse we have not to live for others. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. We preach the cross. People see it as foolish. But preaching the cross is living for someone else. You'll be seen as crazy for it, yet people need to hear it. So we're putting others first when we do that. 2 Corinthians 5.13 For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God. Or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. To the lost world, you're beside yourself. But there are times when you're edifying the saints and you look sober. When you get around a bunch of Christians, you look sober. You don't look crazy anymore. But whether beside yourself or whether we be sober, both are for someone else. When you act crazy because the lost world thinks you're crazy for the stuff you believe, it's for someone else. When you look in your right mind and sober, saying the same things into a room full of Christians, it should be for someone else. Second Corinthians 5.14 says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Jesus Christ died for all because we were all dead meat. He didn't say, I don't feel like dying for y'all today. I'm just going to sleep in. He lived for others, and the love of Christ constrained us. It compels us. It will compel you to love others like Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. 2 Corinthians 5.15 And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. There is proof that after you're saved, you're supposed to live for God, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them. No one is saying you uh, don't have eternal security if you don't. You're saved no matter what you do. But you ought to live for him after you're saved. You have eternal security, but you need to live for God because he died on the cross for your sins. He shed his blood. He was buried and resurrected. And you need to live right for him which died and rose again. And this is a problem today because Philippians 2.21 says, For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. Everybody's just worried about their self. 
They're not worried about the Lord. They're not worried about others. But Jesus Christ took away your right to live for yourself. You need to live for him and other people. Another thing Jesus took away was the old man. When we were are born again, our spirit was quickened and the Lord declared our flesh to be dead. He divorced us from the old man. The old man is dead, but he wants to rise up. You have to remind him that y'all are divorced and you're dedicated to the new man. The old man is the flesh. And through Jesus Christ, you are promised a new body at the rapture. And through Jesus Christ, you can beat down the flesh. Now, Jesus took away. He divorced you from the flesh. But he still comes back. And that's why you still sin. Because this sinful flesh, it, it's not gone yet. You're waiting on a new body. That way you, got, you don't have the sinful flesh anymore. 2 Corinthians 5.16 says, Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. So Paul said, Know we no man after the flesh. He's, he's basically saying we aren't looking at appearance. We're looking at the heart. And Paul was contemporary with Jesus Christ. He's seen Jesus Christ in the flesh. So he said, Though we have known Christ after the flesh, Yet now henceforth know we him no more. Jesus Christ has a glorified body now. He got it when he was resurrected. In Revelation 1, 13 through 15, you see how he looks now in his glorified body. So Paul says, Though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. He's in a glorified body now. Verse 17 in 2 Corinthians 5 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. There is something new about you when you got saved, and that is the inward man. The old man is dead, but the spirit is alive. Now, when it says all things are become new, it has to be talking about on the inside because Paul admits himself he still struggles with sin. In 2 Corinthians 5.18, it says, And all things are of God. Who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So notice it says that all things are of God. This has to be referring to the new man and not the flesh. In Romans 7, 18, Paul says, For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Jesus Christ took away the old man. Jesus Christ cut out your soul loose from the flesh. That's the spiritual circumcision in Colossians 2.11. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Jesus took away the power of the old man. You don't have to live for the old man, the flesh. You can walk in the spirit because Jesus Christ took your flesh, divorced it, from your soul see romans chapter 7 for that and now you can live for the lord you can walk in the spirit the old man he's still going to rise up you know how it's like you you uh, dumped your boyfriend or your girlfriend you got a new one yet that old ex-boyfriend or girlfriend that was a jerk still tries to come around and cause trouble that's the flesh that's how the flesh is. But Jesus Christ, that's one of the things he took away. And then at the rapture, it's permanently going to be taken away. You're going to have a glorified body, fashioned like unto his glorified body. And next, another thing the Lord took away was our enmity with God. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he made it possible for you to be saved and become the friend of God, to be a son of God. When you got saved, he took away your enmity with God. Ephesians 2, 14 through 16 says, For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and then he might reconcile both unto God and one body by the cross, having slain the enmity, Thereby, when you get saved, you are reconciled. Remember your reconciliation. God uh, came down 
in the flesh. Jesus Christ, God manifested in the flesh, died on the cross, and when you believed on him, he took your hand and God's hand and put them together. He reconciled you. You're no longer enemies. Jesus Christ took away the enmity you have with God and made you friends, made you the son of God. Jesus Christ took your hand and the Father's hand and brought them together. That's why it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 19, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So he reconciled the world unto himself. He died for all sins. You just have to accept the payment. Romans 4, 6, Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. 2 Corinthians 5, 20, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. So we are ambassadors of Jesus Christ. We represent Jesus Christ in this strange world that we live in. The entire world is a foreign field. This is not our home. And we need to have the ministry of reconciliation. We need to give the words of reconciliation. Everywhere we go, telling people about the Lord Jesus Christ and how he takes away your enmity with God. How Jesus Christ is the only way to get to God. That's the words of reconciliation. So Jesus Christ took away our enmity with God. Next, he took away our sin. He took away our unrighteousness. When you get saved, your unrighteousness is taken away. It is no longer applied to your record. Every sin you ever committed, past, present, and future, is taken away. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus Christ is the only one who could possibly take away your sin. Notice it says, He knew no sin. And 1 Peter 2.22 says, Who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus fulfilled all righteousness so that he could give it to you freely. Matthew 3.15 says, And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus fulfilled all righteousness when he was here. And when he was on the cross, he became every sin ever committed by every man who ever lived so that we could have our sins paid for and then get his righteousness when we believe on him. But people reject this righteousness. They're still walking around thinking they're getting to heaven because of how good they are or in the things that they've done. They don't understand God's righteousness. They don't understand the grace of God. They don't understand that you're saved by grace through faith without works. And some of them say you're saved by grace through faith without works, but then you got to do good works to keep it, which that's still saved by works. Whether you put the works before salvation, to get salvation, or after salvation, it still works. It's grace through faith to get saved, and then God keeps you saved. Romans 10, 3 and 4 says, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness. That's the people that are trying to get to heaven by their own righteousness. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. When Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins was buried and resurrected, that was the end of the law for righteousness. Now Jesus Christ is how you get righteousness. You come to him as a guilty sinner and believe on him. And he gives you his righteousness. It's not your own. See, when people kept the law, that was their own righteousness. But the problem with that is their own righteousness was never good enough to get them to heaven. It could never get them eternal salvation. But the Lord Jesus Christ's righteousness is what gets people to heaven. That's what gets them salvation. When the Lord looks at me, he sees the blood of Jesus Christ. 
He doesn't see my sin, even though I've sinned since I've been saved. Even though I've probably sinned before I even got done teaching all this in some form. I'm sure I have, because that's how sinful we are, even though I don't even realize it. That's why you should, when you pray, confess sin, any sin you can think of that you've done, and also say, I'm sorry for sins of ignorance. Confess those sins, not to be saved or to stay saved, but it's just good to confess your sins to God. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But when it comes to eternity and how God sees us when He looks at us, the Lord Jesus Christ took away our sin and He took away our unrighteousness. But this has been 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 11 through 21 on things that the Lord has taken away.